Good afternoon, everyone. I think we are ready to go. Uh, welcome to today's event, which is part of a series of McGill-wide virtual events uh, on many issues, including the pandemic. My name is Chris Reagan. I'm an economics professor at McGill, and I'm also the director of the Max Bell School of Public Policy, which is a new, uh, a new creation in the last couple of years. Um, I've got two great speakers with us today uh, who actually happen to be former students of mine. Uh, the first is uh, Danielle Goldfarb, who is a BCom from 1997. She is the head of global research at Rewe Corp, and I'm going to get her to explain what Rewe is all about. Uh, she's an expert in global trade and emerging technologies and the global digital economy. And before Rewe, she spent uh, some time at uh, different think tanks, economic think tanks in Canada. That's Danielle Goldfarb. The other guest is Sylvain Leduc, uh, BA from 1991 and an MA from 1993 in economics. Uh, he's now the executive vice president and the director of economic research at the Federal Reserve Bank in San Francisco. Uh, and from 2016 to 2018, he was a deputy governor at our very own central bank, the Bank of Canada in Ottawa. Um, I'm going to ask each of them, just so you understand the world that they come from, I'm going to ask each of them to give us a 30 second uh, uh, a quick treatment of what their organization does. So Sylvain, let me start with you. What does the Federal Reserve in the United States do in 30 seconds? <laughs> 30 seconds, okay. So we're responsible for monetary policy. Uh, financial stability, supervising uh, the banks. Uh, it's the the system is very decentralized, and so here my responsibility is to brief uh, the president of the bank, being responsible for all the key research inputs uh, that go into monetary policy making. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I'm just going to suggest that while each of us is not talking, we mute our microphones. I think there was some feedback there from yeah. Sylvain. Yeah. Danielle Goldfarb, what does RIWI do? So RIWI stands for Real-Time Interactive Worldwide Intelligence. So we're basically active in every country of the world, uh, measuring public sentiment and behavior in real time. Um, and we're using a, a technology that uh, is able to get access to opinion from the broadest set of the population, including people that are not typically answering surveys, who aren't typically on social media. So we can really get access to what the majority of people are thinking and feeling about, uh, you know, this this pandemic situation. And I should just also add that the technology, the Canadian technology, was actually developed for a different pandemic. It was developed for the H1N1 pandemic to understand how the public was responding to that pandemic. And right now we are now using the technology to, around the world to monitor in real time how consumers, workers, uh, and others are responding to all aspects of the situation, including the economic shutdown and recovery. Great, thank you. So Danielle and Sylvain and I had a conversation a couple of days ago to uh, agree on a, an approximate agenda for this conversation. So let me just set a bit of a stage. Uh, it, whether you think about Canada or the United States or frankly, pretty much any other country you wanna think about, uh, we are uh, you know, 10 weeks roughly into our version of the pandemic. Uh, different countries are at different stages. Um, but we are in the middle of the second quarter, in economic terms, the middle of the second quarter of 2020, and we are probably in the depth of the economic decline. The data won't come out for a while, but we are anticipating that by the time the second quarter is done, by the, by the end of uh, June, I suppose, um, GDP, national income, the level of economic activity, will have fallen by something like 25% from the previous month, uh, previous quarter to the second quarter. That is an enormous decline. It is a super quick decline. It is a deep decline. And even if the economies were to recover almost immediately in the third and fourth quarter, it would end up being an annual decline, probably bigger than anything we had seen since the Great Depression. Uh, and if the recovery is much slower, 
if, if it takes four or five quarters for the economy to get back to its pre-pandemic trend line, then the, then, the, then the impact on the economy is even larger. So we are talking about a huge economic hit. That's the first point. The second thing is that it's been a very different kind of economic uh, contraction or recession. It hasn't been one caused by a lack of confidence or one where households and firms just decide they don't want to spend. It's been a intentional uh, lockdown of economic activity created by the need for people to basically stay at home and self-isolate and therefore not produce. And so if we are not producing and not working, uh, then there's not production going on, there's not income being generated. And it's, and it's very much an intentional, an unfortunate act, but an intentional act designed uh, so that we can then address the health aspects of the pandemic. So that's a very different thing. And the final thing I will just say in setting the stage is that governments uh, around the world have responded in broadly similar ways uh, by, uh, by basically issuing a huge amount of debt uh, so that they can provide income relief to individuals, income relief, or possibly in the form of credit assistance to businesses. Basically, government programs have been designed to build a bridge uh, in terms of their revenues from you know, 10 weeks ago until whenever it is that they return to work. And so the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, has recently projected that government debt uh, in the G20 countries will increase by something like 15 percentage points of GDP, 15 percentage points of GDP. That's a huge increase in public debt that happens basically in a year or even less. Um, now, that's those are my comments in terms of just setting the stage. What I'd like to do is go to our local central banker here, Sylvain Leduc, and ask what, what role have central banks played in helping the governments to finance what's going on and what else are central banks doing? So you can talk about the US Federal Reserve, but you can also talk about other central banks uh, that, you, uh, that you follow closely. Thank you, Sylvain. And then we have to demute you, Sylvain. Okay, good. There we go. <laughs> I wanted to keep you muted. Good, good. Uh, so let me focus a bit on uh, the Federal Reserve, but I think it's indicative of what other central banks have been doing. Uh, the first thing we've done when we had early signs that uh, uh, you know, economic activity would, would rapidly slow down was to lower interest rate to essentially the zero lower bound, the effective lower bound. And so we have we were at, at the, the effective lower bound back in 2008. Uh, we emerged from that uh, in the mid 2010s and, and now we're, we're back at it. So that's the first thing we did. The, se the second thing we, we did is that um, we intervene fairly heavily in, in financial market. And that's because the uncertainty uh, around the virus, the evolution of the virus and the impact on the economy was just so high. I mean, we've seen measures of uncertainty first jumping, you know, doubling a little bit, but then by, you know, the end of March, jumping to levels that we hadn't seen since the Great Recession. So that was really, uh, really concerning. We saw malfunctions in certain markets, particularly even the treasury market. And this is where we get a little bit more concern. So what was happening basically is, is, is people were, were so uncertain. There was a flight to safety. Uh, and, and we've seen even safety, not even in treasuries, but in short term treasuries. So people were even dumping long term treasuries and, and bought short term ones. And so we were trying to lower rates, but at the same time, because of those actions, we saw long term yields going up. So the first thing we've done is that so that our policies could be effective was really to make sure that markets were functioning properly. And, and I think you've seen those types of action uh, around the world. So, so it's, it's, really, it's really what we've been about right now, we, really making sure markets function well. So let me ask you this, Sylvain. Is, is this, uh, because once central banks start printing money, which of course you know, they have always done through history, but massively expanding that activity 
uh, and buying government bonds in huge amounts with basically freshly printed money, some people start talking about the concerns of inflation. Mm -hmm. So is inflation something that we should be worried about in the next year or two or five? Uh, or are these actions from the central bank, are they reversible? Should we expect them to be reversed at some time in the near future? Right. All right, so let me make a few points on this because that's really important for, for central banks, especially those that are targeting inflation, uh, like we are at, uh, to some extent in, in, at the Fed since we have a dual mandate. So the first thing is this shock is interesting because it's both a supply and a demand shock. So we have restrictions on supply that would tend to make prices go higher, and so you'd see higher inflation. At the same time, you see big declines in demand, and this tends to be disinflationary. And I think overall, the, the biggest impact is going to be the latter. So we'll, we should see disinflation uh, for, for the, the short term, for the medium term as well. And I think you see this being priced in in financial markets. So if you look at the break-even rates, so when you compare long-term uh, long treasuries uh, in nominal versus uh, real terms, you see that these compensation for inflation uh, has just gone down tremendously. So, uh, so my sense is that we're going to be in a, in, a, in a way where there's going to be a lot of uncertainty. There's going to be um, uh, people are going to save more, consume less, and that's going to be disinflationary overall. And so uh, I'm more concerned of living in a world where we have uh, below inflation for a long time. And so to your other point, the, the concerns about inflation were there also when we, uh, when we started doing QE back in, uh, in 2009, 2008. And, and what you've seen, a lot of the facilities we've done, you know, they were removed after when the, the, the height of the crisis uh, peaked. You know, we, we removed those facilities and, and we've tried to, to shrink the size of the balance sheet. In fact, you know, you, you go back uh, uh, in September and we thought our balance sheet was too small, giving our desire to operate in a, in a larger uh, balance sheet framework than we had in the past. And, and we don't have that problem anymore, of course. Right. <laughs> yeah, it, is, it requires a pandemic to then to just reverse that problem. Okay, well, let's actually turn to the recovery. Uh, you know, many economies are now starting the process of restarting their economies. They, of course, never shut down completely. But let me go to Danielle and and ask, I suppose, because you are you are watching data every day, and some of that data is, I think, unconventional data uh, to kind of traditional macroeconomists. So, what are the signs of a recovery, Danielle? What are the things that we should be looking for? Uh, is it, you know, should we be looking at the, the sort of normal data that we always look at, or is there some sense in which we should be looking at different kinds of data now? I mean, I think there's a lot of different things that we need to consider just because this is a completely unique situation. Um, the first is the timeliness of the data that we use. We're used, we're used to, you know, labor market data that comes out weeks and weeks after uh, after it actually occurs, we're used to um, we're used to really you know seeing consumer confidence data that maybe comes out at the end of the month, um, and we're really in a situation now where you know we have to monitor these kinds of things on a daily and weekly basis uh, because you know we don't know you know the public health directives came out in the middle of you know the middle of March you can't you can't sort of just say well. Uh, you know, we'll wait till the end of March and then kind of you know, see what's happening. You've got to be able to monitor in real time what's truly happening. And so a lot of the data that we're looking at now is trying to look at, you know, what happened this week? Uh, what happened in the last two weeks as we started to reopen our economies? Did people get rehired? Uh, do people feel comfortable going back to work? Are people going to start shopping again? Um, you know, all those kinds of questions which are getting at both the sort of real time behavior, you know, what are people's are they going back to work, right? Uh, are they going back to work? Are businesses reopening? Um, and then also sort of the psychological aspects. So do people feel safe going back to work? Um, you know, as a parent, can I, do I feel, you know, do I, I have no, you know, do I have confidence and trust that, you know, my kids will have childcare? Uh, you know, those kinds of things that are not um, ones that we typically think about, I think, um, when we're talking about traditional um, certainly not monetary policy, uh, but but you know sort of the range, a suite of policy tools that we have. Uh, we have to think about a whole different range of of, of tools, and uh, and I, I can share some of the data that we're gathering in real time if people are interested as well. 
Well, if, if you've got, I know you've got a couple of slides that you may want to show us uh, sure. that are some interesting developments in the labor market. Do you want to, sure. do you want to show those now? Sure. Yeah, if I can just share my screen uh, to do that. Um, we learned how to do that five minutes ago, ten minutes ago. Oh, there we go. Excellent. Am I sharing my screen? Hold on a second. Um, it works for a brief moment. Hold on a second. Here we go. Can you see this? Uh, can you see the this chart now? Not yet. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Hold on one second. There it is. That's very okay. nice. Oh. Here it is. Okay. okay. Talk us so that yeah, one. this is an example of some of the data that we're gathering um, in real time. So uh, the data, the official data that comes out, uh, the last official data that came out in terms of what's happening in the uh, Canadian and U.S. labor markets was referencing the week of uh, middle, the middle of April. But of course, we're now um, heading into, in most parts of North America, we're heading into this reopening period. So we're really tracking on a daily basis and we're asking um, you know, a random, uh, continuous random uh, group of the Canadian and U.S. population on a daily basis, the same question, you know, what is your working status? And what they're consistently, what they consistently told us is during this sort of April to May period when we're still in shutdown, that about one in five, and, and in some cases more than that, of them were uh, unemployed. And that's very, very, you know, that's extremely significant. Uh, but as we head into this reopening period in the last two weeks, people started to you know perhaps get rehired um, and we're actually seeing a larger share of the population um, that is employed full-time so people who've moved from part-time status into full-time status and also people that have moved out of the unemployment category entirely so we're starting to see these early signs and I think early signs of, of reopening and uh, what the shape of the recovery is going to start to look like. But of course, these are just still the early weeks of, of this uh, recovery period in North America. And, um, uh, you know, so we'll, it remains to be seen what happens in, in June. And the next couple of weeks are going to be really critical to watch. So two comments on this. Doesn't look like much of a recovery yet. <laughs> That's right. uh, and it's worth, worth pointing out that unemployment rates in the United States and Canada before this started were, you know, something like five and a little bit, uh, in yeah. Canada and probably yeah. before below four in the United States, I think. Is that right, yeah. Sylvain? Yeah, yeah. So, so this is it's an enormous increase in the unemployment rate. The other the other thing that's worth pointing out, uh, and it's not in this chart, but Danielle, maybe you can comment on this, um, that the the drop in employment in the past eight or ten weeks has been larger than what you see in the unemployment rate because a lot of people have actually dropped out of the labor force. And right. once you drop out of the labor force, you don't show up in this data. So do you have do you have a comment on that? Or is that is sure. that interesting? Is it just normal? Um, well, I mean, there, there's no jobs to be had, so why would people be, I mean, the, the traditional way we ask this question in official statistics is we say, you know, uh, did you actively look for a job last week? Uh, there was no actively looking for a job last week. I mean, people right. did, first of all, we're trying to encourage people to stay home. And second of all, there were no job, jobs to be had. If you were laid off, you know, there was nowhere right. to look. So um, if you read the fine print of the official data that came out in, uh, uh, in early May, um, with reference to the mid-April period, uh, basically said, you know, something to effect of, you know, add 5% uh, to the, um, to the official rate that came out, if you read sort of further down right. in, the, in the release. So, you know, unemployment rates were really much closer to, you know, 17, 18%, uh, which is actually, you know, and we're getting, our data actually shows that they're even even higher because our, our population is actually, we're actually going out to a different, a broader set of the population. So we're capturing maybe even, even more. Yeah, I'd say, okay. if you, want to, I can add, you know, like on this, it, it's interesting because there's been a, some work done on that and there seemed to be early retirement going on and there are multiple forces happening right now like you think that uh, the hit to to wealth would would uh give an incentives to uh, people closer to retirement to maybe stick around a little bit uh, longer to uh, re replenish their nest eggs but but you know this is a crisis that's uh that's impacting their lives very directly and so the risk of getting uh of getting sick, I think, um, makes people reconsider uh, going back to work, and so and so you might. What we're we're looking at is is whether this drop in uh, 
in the labor force and the participation rate is going to be transitory or are we, are we going to see something more permanent? Well, and on top of that, so the, um, you know, the, the, the probability or the possibility of becoming ill may keep people out of the workforce. But at the same time, a lot of financial wealth has collapsed right. in the last three months. And so some people that would have been on the edge of retirement may be deciding that they can't afford to retire and they need to work for a few more years until those markets recover. So uh, uh, I remember uh, sitting around the round table where I have lunch in the McGill Faculty Club after the 2008 financial crisis started. There were a lot of people that stayed on teaching for a long time. They're still there uh, because they didn't want to retire because you know their pensions had just taken a hit. Uh, Danielle, did you want to show us another slide? Uh, sure, I will. If I can uh, be granted permission to square, share the screen, I was just going to also mention um, that we are collecting data on. Can you see this screen now? Yes. So we're collecting data. So in addition to job loss, um, we know that not everybody has a traditional wow. job, right? That they're they're working kind of a you know standard job for an employer. That there are many people who are working gig economy type jobs. Um, and there are many people who lost working hours, so their hours were cut back and so on. So when we ask this kind of question, asking people, you know, how, what's the impact on your income, we're actually seeing impacts that are much more um, serious, even more serious than the very uh, serious unemployment or unemployment data show. So this is, and, and then I would also add that this is, this is actually when you break it down by age category, you can kind of see that uh, the impact on young people, and this is of a major, you know, we talked about, you talked about the incentives on, on the retirement side, but now we have this issue of this generation of people who are graduating from university, uh, about to graduate or just graduated from university, um, or at the beginning and early stages of their career and entering the labor market at a very difficult time. So this is another thing that we really want to monitor is the impacts on these particular groups of the, the population as well. These two slides really speak to the nature of the government uh, policy response, because when you have such a large fraction of the population that is losing such a big chunk of their income, even even if it's only for a month or two or three, and hopefully it doesn't go on much longer, then that explains why why the dominant government policy response has been basically to give people money, uh, you know, and they've done it in different ways. So whether it's you know uh, uh, basically a cash in your bank account, which is one of the policies that the Canadian government has used and other governments, or whether it's a wage subsidy to firms that then gets passed on to workers. It, it really it really speaks to the nature of the policy response because it's it's not economic stimulus in the traditional sense. It's not trying to increase activity. It's not trying to get people back to work, quite the contrary. It's trying to fill a financial hole while they are stuck at home. Yeah. Um, on those on those data, Danielle, did you have any gender split? Because early on in this pandemic, we were hearing that uh, women were disproportionately affected in terms of income loss and employment loss. And then later I started hearing that maybe it was actually closer to balance than we thought. But do you have any um, gender split on that data? We do. I mean, the official data do show that, uh, you know, yeah, earlier on in, in March and April, sorry, in February and March, the, first, the, the initial round was hitting women harder, uh, then it kind of evened out. And then I guess the, the, you know, as construction and manufacturing, you know, as some of those more male dominated industries um, start to reopen faster than perhaps, uh, you know, retail and restaurant and some other uh, other sectors where women are more uh, likely to be employed, um, we're going to see a differential impact in terms of the recovery. Um, one of the things that we saw, uh, and uh, we have to dig into this further, is the that actually we saw some evidence that women had actually dropped out of our looking to work category uh, recently and into the sort of just unemployed category. And we don't we we have to look into it further. But obviously, there's this childcare aspect. We have everybody at home. Uh, you know, my kids could could burst in here at any moment. Uh, we have everybody at home. You know, really kind of struggling with the. The situation: the schools are closed, camps are canceled, 
Um, and, uh, you know, so there may, that may have a big impact on uh, women's labor market decisions uh, as well going forward. But yeah, all our data, lots of gender split as well. Lots of right. gender. Okay. And we have so, data on, uh, no, we, I was just about to say, we have data a little bit now, high frequency on how, how much people are spending out of the transfer to receive, at least in the U.S., and and the impact is pretty large so people are spending up to close to 40 percent of what they're receiving very quickly and, and and as you would guess people that are more liquidity constrained are spending way more so in that sense in that in that kind of bridging the the gap uh it's having a positive impact yeah i was going to say that that actually aligns with um the data we're seeing in the u.s and canada that uh People are people need the data. They plan to sorry need the data. They need the data, but they plan to spend the cash, <laughs> the extra cash that they're getting from governments. They plan to spend it on on day to day necessities. They need it. Um, uh, you know they need it urgently. And and many Canadians and Americans are living uh, you know paycheck to paycheck. And so this is really, um, uh, you know, this is really uh, It's really important right now to fill that gap. A few minutes ago, I was asking what a recovery might look like, and part of uh, you know recovery is is a forward-looking question, and a forward-looking exercise that economists do is to make forecasts. Now, one of the things that's happened, uh, for example, in Canada, we were going to have a federal budget in the third week of March. Uh, that seems to have simply disappeared into thin air. Uh, presumably, one reason is because in order to do the budget, you have to make a forecast, and the forecasts are now more difficult to make. Even the Bank of Canada, Canada Central Bank, uh, I think is now uh, publishing different types of forecasts. So I wanna come to Sylvain and ask, how do forecasts usually work, okay? Uh, <laughs> and why are, you know, why are forecasts usually tough, but what is it today that makes them so much tougher? What I think, uh... Typically, they work with error bands. That's the first thing to know. <laughs> they're precise in good time, and they're and they're much more so now. I think the the main so first in in terms of monetary policy, fiscal policy, you need the forecast because policy works with a delay, and so you need to know where the economy is going to be in a in a year or two, so that you can uh, fine tune the policy today more appropriately. So that's the first thing. Uh, the, the second thing is that forecasts, you know, we often rely on, on, on data to tease out where the economy is going to go. And, you know, there are patterns in the data that we can uh, work with. With a virus like this one, that's the problem. We just don't have episodes to go back to. You know, we could go back to maybe Asia. There's about five uh, epidemics we could go to uh, over the past 20 years or so. But that's still not telling you a whole lot about the U.S. economy or the Canadian economy. You could go back in history and people have done that. But, you know, if you compare the Spanish flu of 1918 to what's happening now, clearly things have changed. Uh, we, we're not dealing with the same economy. And so that makes it very difficult to have a modal forecast, to think about probability. What's the probability a second wave occurs? What's the probability that the social distancing measures work? We don't quite know. So I think in, a, in an environment like that, and I completely support what the Bank of Canada has done, Thinking in terms of scenarios make a lot more sense to me than putting out the modal forecast. Uh, it's really useful, I think, for policymakers to think about the downside, in, in particular in an environment like here where you have uh, you may care a lot more about the downside that, than the upside just because of the constraints, for instance, on monetary policy. So you want to know what your downside is and thinking about scenarios like that alternative ones uh, is very, very useful. And so just like the Bank of Canada, the, the Fed here, as uh, you know, we have survey of economic projections that we conduct uh, a few times a year. And, and in March, it wasn't done because the uncertainty was too high. And the last time I think this was the case was uh, following 9-11. And so uh, a situation like this, we'll have an SCP round, we'll have economic forecasts. Uh, all the policymakers will provide forecasts in June. Uh, but I'm sure they will know the high level of uncertainty behind them. So uh, I don't think we'll do alternative scenarios. The alternative scenarios are always done, but 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 a company a, a modal forecast. So this time around, I think they'll try to do a modal forecast. Maybe people will talk about you know different scenarios they have in mind. Uh, but so as we get more information, 
I think you'll be able to, to have a better sense of, uh, of where the economy is likely to go at, or, and at least remove some of the scenarios. Danielle Goldfarb, does Rewe get into the, to the dark art of forecasting or do you just stick to the facts? Um, so, I mean, basically because we're measuring both the real-time behavior of people and also their sort of their psychology. So what whether they think now is a good time to go out and buy things and so on. Uh, we actually are in the prediction business, right? So we're really able to say, okay, uh, so for example, we're asking people right now, um, uh, you know, uh, is now a good time to make a major purchase? Uh, are you planning to go out to restaurants this week more than you did last week? Right, right. Uh, for women, are you planning to buy, you know, of your of the things you could buy? Uh, we're monitoring to see how many of them are planning to buy new clothes, which is a sign of, you know, whether they're going to be going out to work. Uh, you know, so those kinds of those kinds of things, we are monitoring many of those things, and we're looking at how they're changing over time to see whether we see points where there's like an inflection point. Uh, we're not we're not doing a GDP forecasts, um, but a lot of the right. data we're gathering could be important inputs because we're gathering these these psychological aspects that are very very difficult to model. Um, and particularly difficult to model when we think that they're going, they may change during different phases of this recovery period. So, you know, maybe people are uh, feeling optimistic in the early days of the reopening period, but then as we get further along, um, depending on, you know, their, their, their trust in the public health situation, that may change. So we have to really, I mean, I think this, the key thing that uh, is important, I think, for forecasters is really to be constantly checking, you know, everybody has these pronouncements about what's going to happen when we reopen and what, you know, what is going to change and what's going to stay the same. And I think the key thing is to recognize that we have to constantly check those assumptions against the data to see what's truly happening. Danielle, have you landed yet personally on kind of your favorite uh, metric for optimism? Like, is it, you know, the percentage of, of, I don't know, men who say they want to go out and buy a new lawnmower? or the percentage of women who say they're, uh, I don't know, they're gonna go shopping or, you know, is it? I, w I wish I could say else? I know what the uh, the magic, uh, the magic one is, the magic question is. If anybody who's watching or any of the two of you have a, have a magic question that we should be asking, I would value that. Uh, I mean, I can tell you the kinds of things that we are, you know, so we are monitoring, um, you know, people's uh, views about, you know, their personal situation, whether they think their own financial situation is going to improve, whether it's going to worsen, what they think is going to happen in the economy overall, because those two things can differ. You might think that you yourself are at risk of losing your job, but the economy is doing what's going to do fine or vice versa. Uh, so we're monitoring those kinds of things. Um, I mean, I think the other thing is uh, we're monitoring things like pent up demand. So, you know, the degree to which um, uh, so we're asking a question now, you know, so, so as the economy reopens, what is your priority for spending? And really what we're not necessarily monitoring is exactly what they're going to spend on. We're actually monitoring the people who say they're not planning to spend on anything. <laughs> um, and we're going to monitor how much that changes day to day and week to week in the coming weeks. So it's really looking about looking at what's not changing. Um, and, and the other thing that's kind of interesting in China, or we, which we're looking at because it's now a couple months ahead of us, um, we're actually looking at those people who don't know uh, whether now is a good time to spend or not. And we're looking at how the share of those people who don't know is changing. So really what we're looking at is how uncertainty is changing, you know, how, the degree to which people are feeling very uncertain. And what we're seeing now in China is very interesting that people are more uncertain now during the reopening phase about whether it's a good time to make a major purchase than they were during the trade war period. We've been tracking this, you know, since 2018. Um, and so we're in, you know, this is kind of a, a very important thing to be looking at, you know, the economy is reopening, they basically return to sort of semi normal kinds of activities. Um, yet there's still uh, quite a bit of uncertainty about what, uh, what, what is the right, uh, you know, what, whether now is a good time to, uh, to, um, to go out and buy things and so on. Um, so yeah, and I will also just mention that one thing that's really, really different now is that we're living in a very digital economy. And so uh, we can't necessarily look at the same kinds of indicators. So if we look at pollution, pollution levels, for example, which is one of the high frequency indicators people are looking at to see whether we're recovering, um, we're not capturing you know, the fact that people are working from home, that people can be buying things online. We're not capturing a lot of these kinds of things. And so we have to look at a lot of these psychological kinds of indicators. 
uh, to get uh, to get a sense of what what is truly happening. Cool. Okay, let me. Uh, I, I want to ask each of you one quick question before we turn it over to start looking at the Q and A from the audience. Uh, and this is the forward-looking question. So, looking beyond the next three months, beyond six months or twelve months, is there something you're concerned about in the longer run? Is it the changing role of government? Is it some trends that you think might be, you know, that that might happen that that we should be keeping an eye on? Sylvain, what's what's one longer run concern? Yeah, I think for for me, I think the crises uh, for sure in the U.S. and some other countries basically highlight uh, the interconnectedness of of everyone and uh, you know like the sort of externalities that are running around the spillovers from behavior from you know individual to the whole community, the community to the nation as a whole, and the importance of public good really. And uh, and I think we've uh, we've skimmed on on spending in terms of public good. Uh, infrastructure spending is is one of them. It's it's well known at least in the U.S. Uh, but more than that, uh, healthcare uh, as a public investment here has, has been much lower than than in other places. Uh, education is another one. And you think about the digital divide. You know, we think often uh, it, it'll be easy. People can work from home. Or they you know even applying for unemployment insurance online is very challenging for many people because you know they might have Wi-Fi of a lower quality with a certain limit. Uh, so the digital divide is playing a big role in this crisis. So investment, I think public investment would be really warranted in, uh, in, in those areas. And, and you know, I'm hopeful, but at, at the same time, uh, I think it's bimodal. I think we could, we could see, we could see uh, people rallying up and being concerned about small probability events with big consequences, like like we've just seen, or it could go completely the other way. And I'm not, at this point, I don't think we're, we're sure how it's going to play out. Well, it'll be interesting to see if in the United States and in other countries, if we actually do have uh, at least the debate about uh, priorities. You know, will we have a debate about uh, the need for greater public infrastructure spending or public health spending? Uh, you know, fundamental debates about the role of the government. It'll be interesting to see if we have those. Danielle, how about you? Yeah, well, I would agree broadly with Sylvain's point that the sort of the crisis has exposed a number of these policy areas uh, that we should have probably paid much more attention to in the past, <laughs> but uh, but is now, but are now becoming like acute problems. Um, and uh, and so we have to we have to kind of uh, you know we have to really address them. If you don't have paid sick leave, for example, then you know people will go to work when they're sick, and then we'll have new other outbreaks and so on. So there's lots of different uh, kinds of uh, different areas that need to be addressed now. Um, I would maybe I would say that one concern I have, and one thing that we're actually looking at, is this question of uh, whether uh, and this is sort of related to. Um, Robert Schiller's uh, narrative economics thesis, this idea that if uh, people believe things are actually going to be, uh, things are a lot worse than they are, then that can actually uh, perpetuate and, and deepen an economic crisis. And so we, uh, you know, so that is, I think, something that's very important. Again, it's a psychological thing. It's not that easy to, um, to model or to measure. Uh, but as we go forward, you know, are people going to be so fearful uh, that the consequences of this are going to be deep and severe, that that's going to lead to a deeper and more severe consequence than we might otherwise have. And so we may want to think about, um, as we go forward, even the sort of the messaging that uh, policymakers use um, uh, that, you know, either reinforce or, or, or don't reinforce those kinds of attitudes. Uh, so that's that's a, a deeper, longer term concern. The economics of self-fulfilling uh, self <laughs> prophecies is very yeah. important stuff. Okay, I'm going to turn to some questions that we've received from the audience. Um, and I'm going to ask the first one to Sylvain, because Sylvain, in some of your comments, you talked about savings rates. Mm -hmm. And this question is about the impact of the pandemic on people's ability to save, either their ability to save or perhaps their willingness to save, either for a rainy day or for retirement. So what do you, have you, have you noticed, what have we noticed so far in the data about savings rates? And what do you think we are likely to see in the future on that? 
Yeah, I think in the data following the Great Recession, you saw a pickup in uh, in savings rates. Uh, you know, some people have more ability to save than others, and then we're back to the the discussion on inequalities. Uh, so it's difficult if you're making minimum wages to to save, of course. Uh, but nonetheless, I think you've seen this around the world, and this is a uh, one of the factor contributing to lower uh, real interest rates. Uh, and so, so, so I think this is likely to continue as people are more afraid, uh, more more concerned about the future, whether they'll be employed or not. Uh, I think we'll see a greater greater desired saving rate, and and so and and decline pushing down interest rates, uh, basically. Can I just add? We we actually asked this question in the past week. Uh, we asked people whether they plan to spend, uh, to save more or less. And in the U.S., about 45% of our respondents are saying that they will save a lot more in the future. This is over the last week. So people are already, that sort of confirms uh, what Sylvain's uh, hypothesis is. So far, at least, we'll see if that actually <laughs> turns into reality. <laughs> okay, I just lost, can you hear me, both of you? Yeah. Okay, I lost my audio there for a moment, but you didn't notice and you just kept on going and that's fabulous. Uh, Danielle, I've got a question for you uh, that also came from the audience about, about, it's really about trade between Canada and the United States. So the question is about if the United States continues to focus on making you know, America great again, uh, and and starts to look more inwardly in terms of its production facilities. What, how should we be thinking about this in Canada, and what kind of a threat is it uh, economically for Canada? That's a good question. I'm not sure if I have a, a full answer to that. Um, I mean, as everybody in the audience knows, Canada and the U.S. are highly integrated uh, from a production uh, perspective in terms of us basically making things together across our shared border. Um, and so already there's been, uh, you know, huge disruption uh, making things together, but also uh, creating things together, both in terms of, you know, products and services integrated. And so already there's been huge disruption um, to our, our relationship and uh, and I, I certainly I imagine that businesses are uh, reconsidering the way that they, uh, they plan their production processes um, in ways that, uh, you know, they were forced to do in the post 9-11 um, period when they were shut down at the border and so on. So, uh, I, you know, all that to say is that, you know, I think I think that that does make Canada a less attractive investment destination when companies are setting up if you know that you can't safely get across the border. And that could have implications for Canada. Um, I mean, we're already seeing big implications uh, on this sort of uh, the question of sourcing medical supplies globally where there's been protectionist actions taken. Um, uh, although, you know, and, and that's very, just very important to be able to keep those uh, those connections going. So there are, there could be important implications. Um, as to what Canada should do about that, uh, I'm not sure I have the answer. Maybe one of you has the answer to that question. <laughs> but you know, Chris, this is, this is accentuating most likely a trend that we've seen uh, over the past 10, 15 years. The Bank of Canada has documented uh, very thoroughly how Canada's lost market share in the U.S. Uh, since the mid-2000s or so. And so uh, most likely I mean, we've seen stabilization in, in global value change growth over the past five, six years. I think this is all going in the same direction, retrenchment in, in terms of trade. But one of the interesting things we hear about is uh, because supply chains got so disrupted in this, well, in, in, in across the world, they've been disrupted. There's been discussion about the need to bring supply chains into the country, to domesticate our supply chains. Um, and I'd, I'd like to know your views of that because it doesn't strike me as obviously correct mm -hmm. that a supply chain that is fully within Canada, for example, is a safer supply chain than one that is, uh, you know, globalized. Uh, I can see the argument for diversifying a supply chain, but I'm not sure about domesticating a supply chain, although I think the politics is going to push to domesticate them. So do you have views on this? Am I, am I right? Am I wrong? I, I completely agree. I think, you know, it's, it's maybe, it's, a, it's an interesting case, this one, because it's, it's a global shock. So of course, if you have you know global chains is going to be disrupted. There's no 
there's no way to hide in a sense. But, uh, but let's say you have other shocks going forward that are more localized than having a global value chain and maybe the ability to switch. I think that's what companies will want to have now, the ability to switch suppliers. They'll, they want to have more options. Uh, in case. So I think if, if shocks are more localized, then having global supply chains make a lot of sense, just in terms of diversification of your of your production. Yeah, I would agree. Diversification rather than domestic d domestication. But yeah, just making sure that uh, you have options. But having options, I mean, if, if, if you have a 10 stage supply chain and now you want an option at each stage, what you're really doing is building bigger supply chains effectively you've got a plan a and a plan b at each stage along the way uh you probably end up with a more a more inch globalized supply chain if to, to get that greater diversification well there are two yeah, things of course In, insurance is costly so that's what you you know so that's an insurance policy basically and that that has a cost uh you'll see this i think with bigger firms you know, we know like around here, the tech firms are, are, are looking at multiple suppliers. We know Walmart has, has the ability to switch suppliers relatively fast. Smaller firms, that's going to be more difficult to do. Danielle? I'm just going to add that, you know, domesticating your supply chain also has, uh, can add significant costs. Uh, so, you know, you're, you're sort of by cutting yourself off to all the options available, uh, you can increase your cost quite significantly. So anyhow, just it just it's not that it's necessarily um, you know that's not necessarily the better option. <laughs> well, and, I, and I think we I think this is going to be one of the interesting discussions and debates that we have in the next few years is the extent to which the pro the problem here was globalization. Uh, you know, and if you really argue that the problem was globalization, then you're going to hunker down behind national borders. If you think the problem, I mean, it may well be the case that this pandemic spread more easily than it otherwise would have because we live in a globalized world, but nonetheless, there are still enormous benefits from globalization. And so the challenge is to get, you know, all the benefits you can from a globalized world, but you know, protect yourself in the way you need. So again, back to Sylvain's point that insurance costs money, right? Mm -hmm. Costs money, and we just got to keep that in mind. Um, let me ask a question about a green recovery, because this is one of the questions that came uh, in the in the audience Q and A. Um, is there? You know, we're starting to now uh, see discussion, hear discussion of the need for green stimulus. So there's two things in there. One is, do we need stimulus of the normal type? And the second question is, does that stimulus need to be, or should it be green? So do you have, Danielle, do you have, you want to start us off on that? Well, I would actually, I would, I'm curious to know what Sylvain thinks. About <laughs> because, no, because the role, because central banks have, have started to wade into this, um, this arena. Uh, and I mean, I can share my personal views, but I would be curious to know what uh, what your thoughts are. Right. So, uh, so in terms of central bank and uh, and climate, so clearly, like central banks are are much more interested than they were uh, in the past about this because it's going to affect the economy, and so we have to at least be be cognizant of uh, of how it works. Um, I mean, in terms of, uh, for us, for instance, at the central bank, and you know, we, we, we're very restricted in, in the terms of assets we can buy. So there's this idea of, um, for instance, in, at the ECB of maybe buying uh, bonds from companies that, have, that are you know, using cleaner uh, energy than, than, than dirty energy. We couldn't do this at, at the Federal Reserve because we, we, we can only buy treasury bonds and, uh, and agency debt. And so, so that limits what we can do. In terms of, of government, so I think going forward, you know, we're likely to be in scenarios where you'll need more stimulus uh, and fiscal policy will have to, to play a role in this. I think in the U.S., the probability that we see this being tilted towards toward green green sector is, is, is little. Um, I think like you could see it'd be great to have money channeled to the states. The states uh, budget uh, are, are in dire straits right now. Uh, you could sort of see federal spending toward greener investments. I think I think it's relatively unlikely. What's interesting that this this uh, 
crises does now, and, and Chris, you noted that at the beginning with the, the large budget deficit and, and increase in debt that we'll see at one point, we'll have to, to deal with that. And, and you know, we'll have to consider either a spending cut or, or tax increase. And so maybe, maybe in some countries, a carbon tax might, might become more viable politically than, than it was uh, uh, a few years back. Well, it's, uh, you know, a carbon tax is, uh, if you want to view it as a revenue generator, you can, you can take that argument. But it's, as you saw in Canada, and as we've seen in other countries, a carbon tax is not a, an easy thing to sell politically. Uh, I mean, I will be the first in line to say why it's a great policy, uh, but it's not easy to do politically. It'll be interesting to see what happens in the United States. Uh, in terms of support along in that direction. Danielle, your view of green recovery? I was just going to mention that I, I think, you know, a lot of the, um, so, I mean, you know, pollution levels are down right now, you know, like there's a lot of actually uh, positive econo uh, environmental impacts of this shutdown. Um, so what I was going to also say is that, you know, that we can think about, you um, some of these practices. So we've now, you know, we know that a number of companies have announced that their employees are now entitled to work from home forever, <laughs> um, right? Like Shopify, Twitter, Facebook, I think, you know, many, many uh, prominent technology companies. Um, and so there may be some natural uh, benefits to the environment of some of the, some, you know, this crisis situation that people realize that it is possible to do this kind of uh, it is possible to work under these circumstances um and that's you know going to have environmental implications as well as implications potentially for real estate housing markets and so on in terms of where people live and all that kind of stuff so there 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 could be some positive um uh environmental outcomes and i guess um you know i guess we have to just be careful when we're talking about uh stimulus policies and so on try to meet too many policy objectives at the same time um you know and we need to make sure that people are going to be um uh, there's going to be some way of making sure people uh, are able to recover and, and uh, you know, uh, have uh, good uh, economic prospects going forward. So I would just say that we have, want to make sure we're not trying to do too many things at once. Well, and this is this is an important policy lesson is that you've got to make sure that you identify what the problem is you're trying to address and then choose a policy instrument that actually can deal with it. Uh, and the idea that if you've got uh, you know, Jan Tinbergen's Nobel Prize winning idea, if you've got 10, you know, policy objectives, you actually do need 10 different policy instruments to address them. Uh, and figuring out which one is the right policy instrument for each objective is, is, uh, is a subject for a future webinar. I, we, we folks are out of time. We've got to bring this to a close. I just want to thank the two of you very much. Uh, Sylvain Leduc, thank you very much for being there. We had some technical issues at the beginning, but we we brought it home. Yep, yep. I want you to know that we in Canada would like you again to return to your home country. We would <laughs> like the benefit of your wisdom. Whether you are at our central bank or any place else, we, we look forward to the day when you return from San Francisco and you come back to the Great White North. But thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Daniel, thank you very much uh, for giving us the, the some of your newfound wisdom about high-frequency real-time data. I think it's wonderful stuff. Thanks to both of you for being here today. Uh, it's great for us to see that McGill grads are out there in the world doing great things. Uh, and the last thing I'm going to say is a bit of advertisement for an upcoming uh, McGill virtual event. Uh, on June 4th, we've got Henry Mintzberg from the management faculty. And I don't know what his topic is, but Henry Mintzberg is always interesting. So, Sylvain, Danielle, thank you very much. And everybody else out there, thank you for joining us. And we will uh, wish you the best uh, uh, for the next few weeks in the pandemic. And we'll see you on June 4th for Henry Mintzberg. Thank you all. <laughs>